Ein anderes Wort, Johannes 10, Vers 27 und 28. Meine Schafe hören meine Stimme und ich kenne sie und sie folgen mir und ich gebe ihnen das ewige Leben und sie werden nimmer mehr umkommen und niemand wird sie aus meiner Hand reißen. Ja, Halleluja, das ist ja fantastisch, was uns der Herr hier zusagt, dass wenn wir seine Stimme hören und wenn wir dieser Stimme folgen, dass uns dann niemand aus seiner Hand reißen kann. Übrigens, das ist ganz wichtig, das müssen wir bei Heilsgewissheit sagen. Heilsgewissheit ist etwas anderes als Allversöhnung. Allversöhnung ist ihr Lehre. Man kann verloren gehen. Nicht alle Menschen werden am Ende zu Zeiten äh, gerettet werden. Und Heils, ähm, Gewissheit ist auch etwas anderes als die Sache, kein Christ, wenn er einmal wiedergeboren wäre, könne noch nicht mehr abfallen. Das kann auch passieren. Niemand kann uns aus der Hand des lebendigen Gott reißen. Das heißt passivisch. Irgendeine andere Macht kann uns nicht tun. Was wir können, das muss man tatsächlich sagen, wir können uns selber rausbewegen, wie bei Lukas 15, der verlorene Sohn. Wenn wir nicht mehr wollen und die Stimme des lebendigen Gottes nicht mehr hören und sie nicht folgen, dann können wir rausgehen und tatsächlich auch die Gnade verlieren. Aber das ist ein anderer Punkt, die Sünde gegen den Heiligen Geist. Wenn ich das aber nicht tue, sondern wenn ich an Jesus bleibe, mit meiner sündhaften kleinen Kraft, egal wie klein sie ist, wie schlimm es ist, aber solange ich mich an Jesus festklammere, darf ich das wissen, niemand wird mich aus seiner Hand reißen. Darauf darf ich mich verlassen, wenn ich an ihn glaube. title of my sermon this morning is Once Saved, Always Saved. It's about the eternal security of the believer, the fact that once we get saved, there's nothing that we could ever do to lose our salvation. Now, usually when you hear the term once saved, always saved, it's out of the mouth of people who are criticizing that doctrine or, oh, you're one of those once saved, always saved. But you know what? I'll just embrace it. Yes. That I think it's a great way to explain what we believe. It's a great term to embrace. And all throughout the Bible... Uh, and all throughout history, derogatory terms that have been used against God's people have been embraced by God's people. For example, they were called Christians by others. You know, they were called Baptists in the Middle Ages many times for rebaptizing people after they'd just been sprinkled as babies. You know, people will attack us and use terms like easy believism, once saved, always saved. I say to all of it, amen. amen. I'm a Baptist, I'm Christian, once saved, always saved, easy believism. It's easy to be saved. You believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. And you know what? It's the hard part that was done by Jesus on the cross. I mean, what, well, how hard is it to get saved? Well, it's as hard as taking a drink of water. It's as hard as eating a piece of bread. It's as hard as opening a door and walking through it. It's as hard as calling upon the name of the Lord. That's what the Bible teaches. Now, I want to prove this to you from the Bible in many different scriptures that we can never lose our salvation. And not only that, I'm going to turn to some of the scriptures that people will try to use to say that you can lose it and show why that just doesn't hold water. But the first thing I want to point out in 1 John 5 is the part that is probably the most controversial. A lot of Baptists don't agree with this. Most independent Baptists probably wouldn't agree with this. But I, I, I make no apology for it. It's what I've always preached. It's what I've believed since I was a child. I'll stand on it now. This church has always stood on it. If you do not believe in eternal security, if you don't believe in once saved, always saved, not saved. Right. You know, and a lot of people won't agree with that, but that's what the Bible teaches right here. Because of the fact that when you talk to people who believe that they can lose their salvation, here's what it comes down to. They're trusting in their works to save them. Because when you're trusting faith alone, you know, when you're trusting Jesus alone, you know you can't lose it. And look what the Bible teaches here in 1 John 5, 10. It says, He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. Now, if you get the context... That's talking about the Holy Spirit, because it talks about there are three that bear record in heaven, three that bear witness in the earth. The witness that abides in us if we're saved is the Holy Spirit of God. It says, he that believeth not God hath made him a liar, because he believeth not the record that God gave of his son. So from that verse, we can tell that there are two kinds of people in this world. There are those that believe on the Son of God, and then there are those who are making God a liar. And why are they making God a liar? Because they do not believe the record that God gave of his son. And then he tells us what that record is in verse 11. And this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life. And this life is in his son. Look, that's what you have to believe to be saved. Yep. 
Verse 11 is the record that you must believe in order to be saved. And if you don't believe that record, you're making God a liar. And there are three elements that I want to point out about that record quickly. It says this is the record that God has given to us eternal life. Number one, it says he's given it to us. It's a gift. The Bible says, for by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God not of works, lest any man should boast. So in order to be saved, you have to believe that it's a gift. You can't try to earn your way into heaven and, and do it by works. You have to do it by faith alone and just receive that free gift of eternal life. So he says, you have to believe the record that God has given. Number one, it's a gift. Number two, he's given to us what? Eternal life. What does eternal mean? It never ends. So therefore, if you don't believe that God gave us eternal life, then you're not saved. So if you think God just saved us temporarily, you're not saved. The Bible says you have to believe that God has given to us eternal life. And the third thing is that this life is in his son. You got to believe that it's through Jesus Christ. These are the three elements that are found in verse 11. And he says in verse 13, these things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. And that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. Now notice, when he says have eternal life, he didn't say had, past tense, that'd be you lost it. He didn't say will get, you know, like you wait till heaven to find out. He says you can know that you have eternal life. Now look, just before I get into all the multitude of scriptures that teach that you cannot lose your salvation. First, let's just look at the word eternal. That says everything right there. Eternal means never ending. It comes from a root word like terminate, right? Termination, eternal. And the E at the beginning is a negating prefix. And so eternal means not ending. It has a synonym in the Bible, everlasting. So let me ask you this. If I have life today that never ends, if I have today on February 23rd, eternal life, and then down the road at some point I were to lose it, was it ever eternal? Because it ended. So if I have eternal life today, that means it can never end because by definition, that's what eternal life even is. Otherwise, it would make no sense. But turn, if you would, to Matthew chapter 7, first of all. Matthew chapter number 7. Matthew chapter 7. We see that we have eternal life. We can know that we have eternal life. Uh, Jesus also said in John six forty seven. He said, verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. Again, present tense, that you have it right now if you believe on Christ, meaning that it's going to last forever. You can't lose it. But look at Matthew 7, 21. It says, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. And I'm going to show you in just a moment what the will of the Father is. But let me start out by saying this, saying Lord, Lord doesn't get you into heaven. If saying Lord, Lord were enough, then this verse would not be true. Is saying Lord to God enough to get you into heaven? No. no. You have to do the will of the Father which is in heaven, which I'm going to show you in a moment what that is. But look what he says next. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you that work iniquity. Now, let me point out, first of all, that he didn't say, I used to know you. Right. Now, if you could lose your salvation, if these people had once been saved and then lost their salvation, could he really say to them, I never knew you if he used to know them? No. So this right here shows that the people who are going to be damned on judgment day, who think they're saved, but really aren't are not people who lost their salvation. That's not possible. It's people who are trusting in, what's the last word of verse 22? Works. works. The people who are trusting in their works, Jesus says to them, I never knew you. Not I used to know you because you can't lose it. They never had it in the first place. Now look, if you were to stand before God right now and God were to ask you, why should I let you into heaven? Would you say I've done many wonderful works? No. Absolutely not. No Bible believing Christian, no one who understands that salvation is by grace through faith would ever say to God, but God, how can you not be letting me in when I've done so many wonderful works? The only person who would say such a thing is one who thinks that their works have something to do with getting them into heaven. Look, I mean, look what they're listing. We've prophesied today. We've done preaching. 
We've done wonderful works. We've cast out devils in your name. Look, are these people claiming the name of Jesus? Yeah. Have they called Jesus Lord? Yeah. Are they doing a lot of wonderful works in Jesus' name? Yeah. So why in the world are they cast out? Why are they not allowed into heaven? Because anyone who is trusting in their works is not saved. The Bible says it's not of works, lest any man should boast. Boasting like what? Boasting like, I've done many wonderful works. I have done many wonderful works. I have prophesied in your name and cast out devils. Of course you're going to let me in. No, no flesh shall glory in his presence. Jesus paid it all. All to him we owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. We have nothing to boast of. Our salvation is by grace through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Bible is teaching us crystal clear in this passage that if you go to hell, he never knew you. And if you're trusting it works, even if you're saying, I believe in Jesus, I'm doing it in the name of Jesus, but you say, well, I'm going to heaven because of my works, you're not saved. I mean, that's what the Bible teaches. Now, let's look at the will of the Father, because a lot of people will get confused. They'll see the will of the Father in verse 21 and say, see, you have to do the works. Yep. Well, these people did the works. But go to John chapter 6. Let's see what the will of the Father is. And also, coincidentally... John chapter 6 is another great passage that proves that you can't lose your salvation in several different verses. But the Bible says in John 6, 35, it says, And Jesus said unto them, now, before I read this, what would you say if all of a sudden you got there and, and, and uh, you know, uh, Jesus is telling you, sorry, you can't come in heaven. I mean, you know what I'd say? Is, Whoa, wait a minute. I believed in you. You said whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. You said it's by faith that we're saved. You said that if I confess with my mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in my heart that God raised me from the dead, thou shalt be saved. What's the deal? Is that not true? I wouldn't be talking about my works. I wouldn't be bragging about my works because my works and my righteousness are nothing. They're as filthy rags before God. It's got to be by grace through faith. But look what it says in John 6, 35. And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall well he might hunger in the future i mean what does it say he that cometh to me shall never hunger you see how salvation is a one-time thing you come to jesus christ you eat of the bread of life that he gives you and he said you shall never hunger and he that believeth on me shall never thirst it's the same thing that he said to the woman at the well in chapter 4. When she, he said, look, if you drink of this water, you'll thirst again. If you drink of the water that I give you, it'll be a well of water springing up inside of you unto everlasting life. You'll never thirst again. And it says in verse 36, but I said unto you that ye also have seen me and believe not. So he's talking to people that have not believed. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. Another great verse about not losing your salvation. He says, you guys haven't believed, but one that comes to me, he says, I will in no wise cast out. Verse 38, for I came down from heaven not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. And this is the Father's will. Because remember in Matthew 7, he said, you have to do the will of the Father, which is in heaven. What does it mean to do someone's will? Do what they want. That's a perfect definition. If I said, I want you, if I said to my son, I want you to do my will, that means you're going to do what I want. We're going to do it my way. So look, if you get into heaven, you're not getting their man's way. You're getting their God's way. That's why it says in John 1, 12, uh, 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 but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born uh, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Okay, it's God's will that matters in regard to salvation, not man's will. And what does it say here? This is the Father's will, which hath sent me, that of all which he hath given me, I should lose nothing. Another great proof that we uh, cannot lose our salvation should raise it up again at the last day. Now watch another aspect of the Father's will in verse 40. And this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. So what's the will of the Father? That people will see the Lord Jesus Christ, 
believe on him and be raised up at the last day. What is the will of the Father? According to verses 39 and 40, that people would believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and that none of them would be lost. None of them would ever lose their salvation and that they would be raised up at the last day. Now, look, you cannot lose your salvation. He said in verse uh, 37, him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. Once you are saved, you've been passed from death to life. Go to chapter 5. Just flip back one page. Chapter 5. So doing the will of the Father which is in heaven is not just saying, well, in every area of life, you're always doing God's will all the time, keeping every commandment. You know, if, if it were keeping every commandment that saved us, none of us would be saved. Amen. Number one. Because there is not a just man upon the earth that doeth good and sinneth not. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. As it is written, there's none righteous, no, not one. No one will be justified by the works of the law. No one will be justified by keeping the commandments. But it says in John 5, 24, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life. Again, present tense. You have everlasting life right now. That means it's going to last forever. And if it doesn't, then you never had everlasting life in the first place. Now, what's so silly about this thing of saying, well, you might have everlasting life today, but you might lose it tomorrow. <laughs> Not only is that just completely illogical, because that didn't last forever if it only lasted one day. Okay. Not only is that completely illogical, but when you stop and think about the fact that God knows the future, and you stop and think about the fact that God knows everything, and that God knows how your life is going to go. He knows the end from the beginning. To sit there and think, he knows you're going to lose it, but he just says it's everlasting anyway. He knows you're going to lose it, but he calls it eternal. I mean, that's nonsense. It makes no sense. But he says here that the one who believes on him has everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation. I mean, that's a pretty clear statement. You will not be condemned. He doesn't say you're never going to sin again, but you're not going to be condemned is what he says. And then he says this, but is passed from death unto life. I mean, that's just a powerful statement about the fact that we are saved eternally. We will not be condemned. We've been passed from death unto life. Go back to chapter three, because in chapter three, we find a very powerful scripture that kind of ties in with what Jesus said. I never knew you. Look at John 3, 18. Here's another verse to prove that you can't lose your salvation. John 3, 18 says this. He that believeth on him, talking about Jesus Christ, is not condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed. Now notice the past tense. He hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. There are two kinds of people in this world. Those who believe and those who don't believe. And notice, what does he say about those who don't believe? They have not believed. They never believed. Because once you've believed on Jesus Christ, you're saved. You're a believer. You're sealed with the Holy Ghost. You can't lose your salvation. If you could lose your salvation, verse 18 wouldn't make any sense. To put it into two categories like that. Those who believe and those who have not believed. Because think about it. If you could, let's say that you could lose your salvation, right? And let's say a guy believed on Christ and then down the road... He stops believing. He loses his salvation, whatever you want to call it, right? Well, then he wouldn't fall into any of these categories. Because he neither believes, but you couldn't really say he hath not believed because he did back then. See how this doesn't make any sense? Because it's not true. Because once you believe, you're saved, you're sealed, and you're secure. But let's flip over to John 10. I just want to go through all the stuff in the book of John while we're here. We saw powerful, we saw three back to back powerful evidences in chapter six, just back to back to back that you can't lose your salvation just in the space of a couple verses. We saw chapter five, verse 24, the verse that was shown me when I got saved as a six year old boy. We saw John three eighteen, another powerful verse that shows you, you've either not believed it or you're, you're still believing and you're still saved. You still have everlasting life. Then we see John 10, 28. I give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand my father which gave them me is greater than all and no man is able to pluck them out of my father's hand he says look you're in jesus christ's hand and you're in the father's hand and nobody's going to pluck you out of that hand 
Now flip over to chapter 11. One time I had somebody say this to me. I was out soul winning and I was, you know, preaching eternal, eternal life to someone. And they said this. They said, well, this is what it's like. You know, you're holding his hand and he's holding your hand. And, and he's never going to let go of you, but you can let go of him. Is what they is what they taught. Okay, so c come on up here for a second, John. Let's see if this holds. Come here, John. Let's see if this holds water. Okay, so so let's use this illustration that I was given by somebody who believed you could lose your salvation. Okay, so let let's go here. So I'm holding his hand, right? And, and I'm never gonna let go of his hand, but he can let go of mine, right? Okay, go ahead and let go of my hand, John. Go ahead and let go, son. Let go. Go back to your seat, son. Let go. No, remember, you can let go. I'm not going to let go. But he can let go. He can let go anytime he wants to, right? Right? All right, go sit down. So, so, so you get the point, right? If I don't let go, it doesn't matter if he lets go. He can hold on as tight as he wants. He can let go. He can try to pull it out. But guess what? I'm stronger than him. And that's why he could not go. And the Bible says here, my father, which gave them me, is greater than all. God is stronger than you. So if you were to have this hypothetical tug of war with God, like, let me go, let me go. He's not going to let go because he said no one can pluck you out of his hand because his hand is so strong you can't get out. 